This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Jana Funke and I'm really, really excited to chair today's um, seminar. We have two really exciting papers on the history of sex and the history of sex education in South Africa. Um, and I'll introduce our speakers uh, in a minute, but just a few announcements. First of all, if I could just ask you to sign this book, and um, we'd like to get a sense of the attendance. And if you also want to be added to the mailing list, just add your email address. That would be great. And the next announcement is just to let you know about our next seminar, which is in two weeks, um, on the 27th of May. Again, Tuesday evening, 6 to 8, in this room. And we're going to hear a paper on hermaphrodite sexuality and attitudes of deviancy in 18th century Russia by Professor Mariana Muraveyeva, I think something like that, from Oxford Brooks. We'll, we can circulate details, because I can't pronounce the name. But now, let me introduce our two speakers. Um, we have Dr. Catherine Burns Hi. and Dr. Sarah Duff, and they're both coming to us today from the University of, um, no, another difficult name to pronounce, Witwatersrand, Good. something like that, yeah. well in Johannesburg. Uh, and they're both based <coughs> at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research. So I'll introduce Catherine first. Um, Catherine Burns is a historian who's working on medical and health history, the history and ethnography of reproduction and sex, ethics and biomedical research, and the history of gender in Southern Africa. She has lectured and held research positions at different universities in the US and also South Africa. And she teaches and supervises across a number of different disciplines, which I think is really, really impressive. Um, she's currently completing a manuscript for a jointly authored book on the history of major health institutions in South Africa. And she's also working on a biography of a herbalist and midwife who lived and practiced in South Africa in the late 19th and early 20th century. She's inaugurated a project on sex histories called POSH, and she's also very active in developing collaborative research on the medical humanities in Africa, which also sounds fascinating. Our second speaker is Sarah Duff, who actually did a PhD at Birkbeck, so I assume that this is all very familiar um, to her. Her first monograph is coming out this year with Palgrave, and it's entitled Changing Childhoods in the Cape Colony, Dutch Reformed Church Evangelical evangelicalism and colonial childhood, 1860 to 1895. And Sarah is interested in the intersection of histories of medicine and childhood, and her research examines the work and influence of Truby King's mothercraft movement in South Africa during the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and Sarah has now begun on a history of sex education in 20th century South Africa, and her talk today will tell us a bit about that new project. Um, so we're going to start with Catherine's paper, and then we're going to have Sarah's paper, and at the end, loads of time for discussion. We're also going to go to a pub afterwards and have some dinner, so please do join us if you want to discuss the papers in a more informal um, environment. So we're going to start with Catherine's paper, which is entitled The History of Sex in 20th Century South Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for such a warm welcome here. It's absolutely splendid to be here. We've been thinking about it, in fact, almost fantasizing about <laughs> it for months. So it's an absolute delight to be here. Thank you for your warm invitation. Um, I'll plunge right in. I'm taking about a 32-page paper and drawing it down to about 20 key points and hoping in the course of setting up this skeleton that I have enough flesh on it so that we can um, parry and have good debate mm -hmm. afterwards. I'm particularly keen on advice, suggestions, and criticism, no matter how harsh, on whether or not I'm making any theoretical as well as empirical sense. Um, obviously, it's ludicrous to present a paper on the history of sex in South Africa. What an astoundingly uh, bizarre and hubritic thing to say. Um, what I'm trying to do is to tunnel in, obviously, on a period. Uh, a country called South Africa has only existed since 1910, so capital S, capital A. Before that, obviously, and I'm going to speak a little bit about that in a minute, um, the history of people, of movements, of social ideas, of practices in the region of Southern Africa, somewhat south of the Zambezi River, is complex and has a huge impact on uh, the 20th century, on the last century and a bit. Uh, and I'm trying to understand in the paper to what extent I can look at the legacy of that as well as try and understand this thing called South Africa, first a union and then a republic, certainly not democratic until very recently. What happens around sexual personality, sexual statehood, sexual citizenry, sexual practice in that place? So I'm already defining down the topic, even as I introduce it. In the early 1980s, 
when South Africa was involved in the final throes of its last phase of formal apartheid as a kind of state governance, um, and in the midst of a huge social and economic revolution internally, many of you would have been involved in the external revolution around it, the South African government began to make changes to its formidable arsenal of laws and procedures around sexual deviance, what was called sexual immorality and vice. And the timing of that was extremely interesting. It wasn't lost on anyone, uh, you know, let alone the Guardian newspaper published um, uh, in this country, that the, that the link between dismantling apparently some of apartheid's uh, sex law arsenal and its attempt to find, a sort of final attempts to find favor with Western governments, particularly that of Margaret Thatcher's here in this country, that they were linked to each mm -hmm. other. And so my paper begins with a series of arguments from the mid-1980s when South Africa is in the middle of a second state of emergency and one of the most obdurate leaders ever born on the African continent was the head of, of state, a man called P.W. Boerter. And as uh, the cabinet begins to meet and dismantle some of what they consider to be um, uh, laws that Western governments were giving them uh, huge amounts of trouble about, they ring fence a whole series of areas of government in a state that would remain completely untouched. But they began to dismantle a body of laws which I'm arguing in this paper were actually central to the existence of South Africa's illegitimate white capitalist power. So very interesting because I'm, I'm making an argument that you may find flawed by the end of the paper that how South Africa came to exist as a state depended extremely and not precariously on their insistence on a whole range of sex politics, a form of pubic politics. By the time the white state is in the final throes of its existence, it seems to have lost the plot on realizing that pulling out the plug on a number of these really key areas of governance, of biopolitics, of law, and of institutional life is actually also going to be very, very, um, it's going to undermine and make very vulnerable their position. So this is a, it's a slightly new argument I think I'm advancing. The typical um, uh, published record, which some of it are very, very, by very formidable historians, one of whom is in the room, on what brings the South African state to its knees include obviously complicated arguments about internal uh, class fractions, so Marxist or neo-Marxist arguments about labor power, about worker consciousness, and about the movements of youth and of others against the state, so sort of revolution from within. And then obviously also complex arguments about everything from massive anti-apartheid movements across the globe and the impact of boycotts, uh, everything from the petrochemical industry through banking and mortgage boycotts, through uh, classical uh, political theory arguments that say this was an untenable situation, a kind of trapped colonial mentality in a world that was changing with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of a new form of international geopolitics, having this crazy group of nutcases running the last outpost on the southern tip of Africa was not possible anymore. And there are many variations in between of these arguments and different forms of historians will place different weights on these. So now I'm advancing, I think, a new argument into the space. Of course, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, not only historians of, of Southern Africa, but historians of other parts of the world uh, achieving forms of democracy in the mid to late 20th century, and historians of sexuality. So I think of a, of a writer and an anthropologist historian that you may have heard of, Anne Stoller, whose very important critique of Foucault, race and the education of desire, and her work such as carnal knowledge, have attempted to look at Southeast Asia in a similar way, and there would be many, many other examples I could give, but I'll just flag her. So let's plunge in. Um, I'm describing in this paper the condition of the South African state and the people that lived within its borders as being one of nervous conditions. And I'm drawing on the writing of a Zimbabwean novelist called Tsitsi Dangaremba, who wrote a really powerful debut novel called Nervous Conditions, in which the personal is made political. So for example, an exploration of early adolescent desire and of a young woman's encounter with her own menstruation leads to a critique also of the life of people under the last um, sort of throes of the Rhodesian state. And I've been thinking about that book for many years because it's had a huge impact on South African novel writing and Southern African poets. 
but it's had almost no impact outside of the literary field. It's not seen, in other words, as a critique of state power or of how a white colony operates. The fourth point that I want to make is that one way into a history of sex in South Africa, which on the face of it seems probably quite boring and straitjacketed, is to go through the legislation on censorship, on what was identified as outside of, as profane, as graceless and outside of the uh, purview of the civilized person. Huge amount of energy was spent, as you can well imagine, in South Africa in the 20th century, drawing off of British colonial imperial energies in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, and added to with the chili powder of Afrikaner nationalism in the late 19th and early 20th century, on defining who is a citizen, who is a subject, who is native, who is other, uh, who is a voter, who has full majority. And woven in a t in tapestry like form through all of that energy, a lot of which ends up being um, displayed in constitutional and in uh, jurisprudence space, is this concept of the censor, the place of the censor in the state, the people entitled to censor others, speech and acts and positions and forms of being that are censored. And later on, this language and this discourse leads to banning orders in which people are incarcerated or taken out. A, a sanitation syndrome emerges. Many of you will be familiar with the public health histories of Africa and of the colonized world where a cordon sanitaire becomes the way in which you separate one group of people from another. And of course, this is also true in parts of European and North American history. Well, in Southern Africa, this sort of takes a, a leap forward. There's a kind of testosterone to this, and there is an enormous amount of imbrication of censorship law throughout many forms of South African social life and being. Where we have seen quite a lot of writing on this, and some of it is outstanding, is around the censorship of writing. And I've been part of projects that have considered this before. So I've looked at the way in which novelists or authors or people writing particular kinds of political tracts or people living inside of mission stations or on the edges of metropolitan institutions have uh, used words and tin trunk lit literacies and other forms of pamphleteering to speak back and then the, the forms of oppression that, that came out of that. I don't eschew any of that work, but I see now that my understanding of what was being targeted by censors was somewhat narrow. And the way that I've come to understand this is through uh, the theoretical lenses that I've been persuaded are useful from the colleague of myself and Sarah at Weiser, a man by the name of Ashil Mbembe, quite a formidable, I would say, historian and philosopher of the African condition. I don't know if you've read his famous very early work called On the Post-Colony and his conception of the sort of cannibalism and autoeroticism of West African uh, late 19th and early 20th century, and particularly the post-colonial world of Cameroon, of Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Um, he has written in a very hair-raising way about the big man and the emergence through particular kinds of institutions that are very vulnerable to the emergence of the big man, kind of patriarchal politics that flourished um, and was, um, was given a huge amount of manure in the post-colonial moments of some of those countries, particularly after the 1970s. So Scheel has written extensively in the last couple of years about Afropolitanism and the, uh, the movement against parochialism, tribalism, inward lookingness on the part of many people of African descent, <coughs> which is a sort of counter tendency to uh, various kinds of hegemonic patriarchal uh, dictatorships. And this theorizing of Ashil Mbembe about the restlessness of the Afropolitan imagination has been very inspiring to me. And one way that I've taken this into archival work, so you know, being a more jobbing social historian, I've gone back to archives and interviewed people and records, and I've seen the way that this imagination was. Uh, it was bubbling under, and it had a certain kind of eminence in South Africa. It never emerged into street politics en masse, into the 1968 Paris scene, or something equivalent in London, or the Caribbean, or uh, Haiti but it is recordable and it is evident and traceable, and that's what I'm very interested in finding. Whether it's uh, histories of a queer or transgressive life, particularly in urban environments, 
and reading that back into the past, whether it's forms of dress, sociability, whether it's modes and styles of address, and whether it's alternative lives that people were able to develop outside of the status quo. These all seem very fertile areas for investigation. And the paper goes into some depth about where I'm trying to find this. So this part of the paper is a kind of examination of the archival method that I'm using, having been influenced by the theoretical literature. And then I return to the 1974 Publications Act, a key moment, I think, when uh, the hubris of the South African state was at its grandest point. In the late 1960s, many people thought South Africa as an entity was sure to collapse. But the South African government was never richer and never had more state resources than the period just leading up to the 1973 world oil crisis. Around about the time of my birth, in December 1966, all the way through to 1973, the South African economy was the fastest growing economy in the world. I know, it's almost impossible to believe now. The rand was worth two pounds sterling. It's unbelievable. I think we're like 22 rand to the pound now. And the South African petrochemical industry had just announced to the world that they were able to make oil from coal. Remember, South Africa was embargoed. So it was an extraordinary time, and South Africa was a police and military state. And in the middle of that, in 1974, they passed into law a bill that they'd been planning since 1971, which was unbelievably draconian about control over all f a range of discourses. And of course, it was built on acts that I'm going to refer to now. The first chink that appeared in that particular armory was in 1983-84, when F.W. de Klerk, later to go on and win the Nobel Prize with Nelson Mandela, who was then Minister of Education and had the publication uh, board and the censorship board under his control when he began to develop with his cabinet a critique of some of their own laws and a discussion began to emerge about liberalizing, that was the word they used, a South African censorship law. Immediately the ANC in exile and many other groups including the anti-apartheid movement here in London decried this as a trick, as a conjurer's trick. Um, do you think that just allowing us to read Lady Chatterley's Lover or finally allow us to read Masters and Johnson's Study of Sex or any number of texts, books, films, do you think this will con us into thinking that we are free, said the ANC's Radio Freedom based in Tanzania. And Reuters produced a widely circulated report uh, a couple of years later, which of course was picked up by papers all over the world, making the argument that this was complete window dressing. Very, very interesting. Laughable, said Oliver Tambo from his house in London, uh, that people were not going to be sacrificing their lives in South Africa so that we should be allowed to have girlfriends across the colour lines. Uh, and he went on record later on that evening on Radio Freedom from Tanzania saying the issue of the removal of censorship around sexual matters and immoral immorality matters in South Africa was completely irrelevant at this stage to the liberation movement. So one can imagine exactly the sentiments that produce that, uh, that thesis, and I'm of course arguing the opposite, that in fact this was very significant and something very important that was happening. In 1985, on April the 16th, so, you know, flippin' hell, quite a long time ago now, Reuters produced a widely circulated report as well on the repeal by Parliament that morning of the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act and, six, and Section 16 of the Immorality Act. I'm arguing that these acts, they first started coming into being uh, under Cape, Natal and other colonial legislation, most of it promulgated by British barristers in the period from 1880 till about 1906. From 1911 to 1917, uh, for obvious reasons, there wasn't a huge amount of work inside of the Cape Parliament around uh, domestic law because South Africa was very involved in uh, a Boer rebellion in a series of minor strikes, and then of course its involvement in World War I. But after 1917, the South African government really begins to crank it up with the creation of a whole range of local laws. And the Minister of Justice at the time is a formidable person of world repute, who's going to later on go on and write the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, and that is Jan Christian Smuts, educated here in your own country. And one of the things that he's obsessed about in the period from 1917 to 1921 is the problem of immorality and vice. As a very young man, recently educated in England, 
and back in South Africa before South Africa becomes Union and before the Second South African War, known as the Anglo-Boer War in some circles, so Queen Victoria's last stand. In that period, Smuts had been the Minister of Justice of what was the Kruger, so-called Boer Republic, of the Transvaal. And in that period, he tried to save Johannesburg from its status as the Sodom and Gomorrah of the imperial world. And Charles van Onselen has written a two-volume study that very memorably captures the world of pimps and prostitutes, the Buenos Aires um, uh, lady sellers, and the bearded men from London who uh, had breasts, and so on and so forth. So if you wish to read a romp of social history note, there is that two-volume study. And Smuts uh, regarded the world of the mining camps, of the uh, segregated spaces that men of African descent found themselves in, and that white men of ill repute from all over the empire, um, he found that to be disgusting and heinous. And for example, one of the things Smuts said, there should never be a university in Johannesburg. This is no place for a university, because this place is a filth hole. And so he practiced, actually, a lot of his attempts at using cordon sanitaire and laws around immorality, vice, interweaving this, of course, with a whole range of work around public health to create a, a kind of template, out of which later, when he became Minister of Health of the country as a whole, and later on Prime Minister, he sort of elaborated and worked with his later Ministers of Health, of Education, of Law and Order, and uh, of um, uh, justice to, to uh, turn into a formidable arsenal. If we tunnel into the era from 1910 to 1948, I hypothesize in this paper that, the, that a variety of forces sped this along. Uh, Sarah's going to spend, I think, a lot of time, so I'm not going to take any air away from that, around Christian teachings, around the elaboration of missionary and late Victorian, early Edwardian ideas about sexuality. South Africa had the great dis, you know, misfortune of having been colonized by Christians at perhaps their lowest moment on earth, especially regards uh, sexual freedom, sexual expression, and ideas about um, sexual peace and sexual joy. So unlike most of Latin America or even Southeast Asia, where Christians happened on those shores when they were perhaps struggling or more open or you know, had you know, polymorphous perversity as their major theme, the Victorians who came to places like Durban and Johannesburg and the Eastern Cape in the 1880 to 1920 period were m often people with a lot of suffering, carrying a lot of baggage. Uh, I supervised an excellent MA thesis a few years ago by Anne Shadbolt, and what she tried to understand was a woman called Louisa letters back to her sister in Hull as she tried to become a mother and continue to have a love relationship with her husband, bore him 13 children. They didn't actually talk to each other for seven years of their lives when she conceived and bore four of the children. Um, and her confusion and her trauma around her deep repression of her own sexuality and the long discussions that she had as she became fluent in Zulu with women that were living very near to her in a region called Camperdown um, who had not come under Christian persuasion and who had a very different idea about habitus and the body and sexual expression and her, her real trauma and also her insights into the viciousness of the repressive nature of Victorian hypocritical sexual teaching. So, the 1910 to 1948 period is not a period in which people have freed themselves from this, far from it. And so commercial agriculture, the emergence of biomedical institutions and practices, these along with Christian teaching, Christian education, ideas about Christian morality, they really began to create a kind of bricolage, a very, very heavy bag for many South Africans to, to, to carry. And in this period, I'm very interested in tracing courtship rituals and how they were altering homo and heterosexual sociability, the role of army, the role of mind compound, the role of women nurses, the role of girls only schools, and so on and so forth. And trying to understand how marriage law, sexual intimacy, uh, notions about public sexual hygiene practices, and state regulation of all of these uh, formed and shaped each other. So that by the time we get to the moment of the introduction of the apartheid state in 1948, in the last, the dying years, the post years of the Second World War, we can see what kind of uh, formations ha have, have formed this frame that then the apartheid state ideologues take as their given foundation and begin to work with. And I'm asking what forms of sexual life survived from the era prior to colonial rule? 
I want to see how these compare with other regions in the British Empire and how settlers and migrants from Europe, the Americas and Asia began to rearrange and shape or recombine notions of intimacy and sexual life. And I want to understand the so-called distinctiveness of male migrancy to the mining centers uh, as part of this, of this new form of sexual sociability. And I want to see if we read the evidence from South Africa against a wider world map, did sexual life follow the lineaments of race, class, regional divisions, or were there formations of South African wide shared sexual histories? In other words, I'm asking this question, how has sex through time worked to make South Africans? Um, the medicalization of sex section of my work is the one that I'm on the safest ground with in my own intellectual past, because I've worked for a long time in the history of medicine and of the rise of medical schools and the first mission hospitals and the first state hospitals. I've looked at the emergence of the first cohorts and now very low, large cohorts of African trained uh, and educated midwives and various kinds of paramedical professionals. And those archives are very familiar to me. So I'll spend less time on that because I feel more convicted about my own conclusions there. In short, biomedicine began to pathologize certain kinds of sex in ways that are recognizable to those of you who work in Europe or other parts of the world. But in South Africa, because there was so, because medicine became linked so powerfully to uh, elite whiteness, all forms of health and medical practices and ideas about the body and health that were outside of what medicine called itself became stigmatized as African and other much more powerfully even than they would have in the continental United States or here. So for example, homeopathy or parallel practices of massage or different ideas about childcare were pathologized as native, barbarous and uncivilized in a way that was sharper than I think it would have been here. Perhaps the equivalent would be the sort of stereotyping of people of Irish descent and their barbarous practices. And of course, there would be class discourses inside of the United Kingdom that would suggest that people who eat dandelion soup are not going to be parliamentarians. Um, but there's far more contestation here, all the way through to you know, your present heir apparent to Queen Elizabeth II. In South Africa, if you visit a herbalist or a healer in the period that I'm talking about, or you choose to have your child at home, or you suckle your baby when they need to be suckled rather than four hourly feeds and so on and so forth, you obviously can't become a citizen because you're not a full uh, human being. Are you even a Christian? That is in debate. One of the areas that I'm fascinated with, and in this sense I'm an anti-Foucauldian, is that medicine and medical discourses and the pathologizing of venereal disease, the public health acts that are used to control people's movements, their relationships, um, the insistence rather American style eugenics on various kinds of tests before people can have intimate relationships that are sanctioned by the state, the way in which children are allowed or not allowed into schools, the way in which people are pushed into rural areas or into different suburbs, the way people can be buried or their bodies treated, all of these ideas seem to present a formidable biopolitics. And there, of course, have been several, I think, really dreadful books about South Africa in which there is the state, biopolitics, and the completely frail, vulnerable, subjected person with the, you know, benthamite gaze. This is not true. It's demonstrably false. It, uh, the vulnerabilities in the system crackle the minute you leave one form of archive. If you read the South African Medical Archive, you would think that every single person in South Africa was vaccinated, obeyed the state, and did everything they were told to do from wearing school uniforms to vomiting twice after emetics. South Africans are chaotic and unruly like most people in the world. They pushed back, they farted, they burped, they hid away, they put poison inside of medicines. Doctors were conflicted themselves, presented with certain kinds of uh, body politics and beliefs. Um, uh, even the most formidable medical institutions in the country compromised, made deals with the devil, went in through different doors. To this very day, South Africans uh, practice forms of plural body living. They don't only go to the cathedral to pray for their child who's got tuberculosis or HIV. 
They also cut their skin and put various medicines in it, and they take antiretroviral medication. They do all of those things. In other words, they are not simply the subject of this very powerful form of medical pathologization, and so too with sex. Um, the most hair-raising read I could perhaps recommend to you, and it's definitely in libraries here, is a series of books written by Louis Franklin Freed, a psychiatrist, a man who studied what he called neurosociology in Amsterdam, a man with a medical degree and a professor of anatomy. He wrote a book called The Problem of European Prostitution <coughs> in Johannesburg. And his set of, um, I should say, almost for your documents where he spent nearly 25 years observing and watching in disguise on the streets of Johannesburg's the underworld lives uh, of sexual flaneurs, as he called them, makes for interesting reading. And all of these documents are housed in a historical papers collection in Johannesburg. And this will lead me to the last part of my presentation. Why did this man, Louis Franklin Freed, formidable and respectable medical educator in Johannesburg, why did he call his book The Problem of European Prostitution in Johannesburg? It would seem a relatively limited topic for someone who spent a quarter of a century studying everyone that came across the streets. Because, of course, the problem was the Europeans. And this is where I suppose I'm, I'm getting to the more dangerous ground of the paper. And hopefully you'll be able to help me here. You will all remember the 2000 to 2007 suffering of our country when the then president, Thabo Mbeki, went through a kind of um, a sort of epileptic seizure of his intellectual capacity for about eight years, convinced that the world regarded people of African descent's bodies as sexually tortured and dangerous. He began reading the work of people, eminent historians like Megan Vaughan, who gasped with horror when she saw the way he cited her work, saying that HIV was the final, most dastardly plot of the West, of pharmaceutical companies, of people at places like the University of London, to try and undermine the self-worth, the power, the autonomy, and the dignity of people. HIV didn't exist. Poverty was the cause of most diseases. Sexually transmitted infections were a fabrication in the mind of people who had South Africa, in, South Africa not in their interests. He ended his presidency still saying that. And of course, as a result, in the period that he was president, most of the uh, technologies and treatments that have become uh, very widely used and efficacious were withheld until massive action, massive uh, energy, massive activism on the part of people, including somebody sitting in this room, finally forced the Constitutional Court of the country to say, this is not true, Mr. President, you have to give people biomedical drugs, including from the companies that produce the anti-TB drugs that you've been on three times in your own life, uh, because he's been near death several times because of childhood developed tuberculosis. And he was swept off the stage for a new, quite dramatic and hair-raising chapter in South African history to begin. But there's something around that time of Thabo Mbeki that we need to think about for a minute, because it shows, it throws a spotlight onto something very important. For most of the 20th century, and if I went back further, this would be even truer, the, uh, the pathologizing of the African person's body and of their sense of self and of their worth has been very much at the heart of the South African state project. And even though after 1994, formidable efforts were put into completely reorganizing constitutional definitions of personhood and of trying to scrape back the layers and layers and layers of hurt and pain and of institutional power that grew up in that manure, we are sitting as a country with the hypocrisy and the bruising that has resulted from that, the straitjacketing. So how do we write in a way that's not teleological and Whiggish about this? You know, for example, uh, you'll often open a book. I just opened up one in the London Review of Books bookshop just now, which is a new introduction to Mandela's writing. And it begins, you know, 1990, uh, Mandela is released. Then there's a period of terrible violence and debate. In 1994, the first proper elections are held. We're right in the middle of the anniversary of that, of course. And straight after that, a new constitutional dispensation emerges after two years of negotiation. And so Nirvana is achieved from what was hell. And there is the line from, from Ribic in the Cape through the dastardly years of the British to freedom. 
So say we find that that is not a very plausible set of arguments. What about a more ragtag, complex, echo effect, dialectical approach to the story of South African sexual freedom? The second paragraph in this introduction, which is a, a Macmillan book, says, South Africa has the most liberal, progressive constitution in the world. Not only does it declare all the rights that we've known since the French and American revolutions and the Haitian revolutions, it also says that every person has the right to their own sexual autonomy. Um, later promulgations, including the change in the Marriage Act in 2007 and the change in the definition of gender in 2006 mean that South Africa is one of very few countries in the world where a person has the right to be chaste, to have sex with anybody of any gender as long as it doesn't hurt that person's rights, but not to have sex with a legal minor or with an animal that can harm them or a person with disabilities. Otherwise, people have a right to sexual expression and sexual autonomy, which is almost unparalleled in the world. So how did we get to that? Were the seeds of that always there? Was this always like a lotus waiting to unfold? Or, in fact, did the scratching and fighting around immorality and around mixed marriages acts, in other words, the huge trauma and emphasis on poor whiteism and the efforts to ensure that there would be a personality called white and a citizen called white on the southern tip of Africa, did all of the energy around that, which meant policing of sex, it meant policing of venal thoughts, it meant policing of childhood and bastardry, it meant policing of marriage, and all of the way in which church and medicine and judges and teachers and nurses and social workers were implicated, stinkingly so, in that all through the sewer of the 20th century. When that got ripped back, what needs stayed on the table? Who in the secularized world of 2000, let alone 1990, or oh, the other way around, 1994, let alone 2000, would be able to declare, no, marriage has to be built on this Christian rock, or it has to be built on this biological natural rock because that exact rock was the rock proclaimed from 1910 to 1994. So nobody would be able to stand up and say this is progressive or this is godly or this is what nature declares because all of that had been stripped bare. Those arguments had all been used. People like Jan Christian Smuts or later Vavut do not say we believe in a, a religion called, I don't know, Inky Pinky and we have this understanding of what produces a, a real moral union. They had used the same texts of the Old and New Testament. Every single time they spoke about sex or banality, they quoted from Leviticus, they quoted from the New Testament, they quoted from the mouths of people who were Western leaders and philosophers. Hegel came up many times in the South African Parliament. So these were not going to be useful enlightenment or biblical figures. And so the edifice fell down. But of course the gap between de facto life in South Africa and de jure transformations is maybe wider than it's ever been before. But I won't end on a sad note. There are polymorphous perversities. Yes, South Africa has the shocking distinction of being the rape capital of the world. And we have enormous amounts of tension and anxiety around youth sexuality. Elderly people regularly describe being traumatized by the sadness and pathology they see in young people's sexual relations and that's part of my project is to try and capture the thinking and the wisdom of octogenarians on the matter but we also see evidence especially in the city that uh, sarah and i have the great fortune to live in of uh, older middle-aged and young people's sexual cultures and expressions which is extremely heartening so I'll end there. thank you Thank you so much for a really, really rich and fascinating and very engaging paper as well. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Duff, and her paper today is entitled Facts About Ourselves, Teaching Sex Education to South African Children, 1919 to 1939. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for having us both um, present. Um, so Towards the end of 1924, Dr. J.A. Mitchell, uh, Chief Medical Officer of the Union of South Africa, spoke at the presentation of the eighth annual report of the Transvaal Council for Combating Venereal Disease. 
And the theme of his speech was on the need for improved and more widely available sex education for adults as well as for children, and the periodical child welfare reported. It was necessary to enlighten the great mass of the people from the child upwards. He regretted that so little was being done in the schools. Children were not fools. Their instruction in the subject was quite practicable. It was perhaps easier to deal with girls than with boys, but in any case, in the education of youth, there was no time for false modesty. Now, his comments were uncontroversial. As Karen Jokerson has demonstrated, during this period, anxieties about venereal disease, particularly syphilis, coupled with shifting views on the treatment of these diseases, had resulted in a variety of attempts from both the state and philanthropic organizations to make available education about sex and STDs mainly, but not exclusively to adult men. Moreover, there was consensus among a range of churches as well as welfare and health organizations that some form of sex education was needed to be provided to young people. Superficially, debates over the introduction of formal sex education in South African schools after the conclusion of the First World War paralleled similar developments abroad. As in the US, the, US, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, and parts of Europe, social reformers and public health specialists became interested in sex education in the midst of a global panic about syphilis and, and BD. And partly connected to this, out of eugenicist concerns for the health of the, of, of the race, of the nation, taught to both adults and children by a variety of media, ranging from lectures and pamphlets to films and posters, sex education was, like the wider availability of contraceptives, a means of ensuring the physical and moral health of the nation. But South Africa differed from the rest of the world in some significant uh, ways, and this despite um, connections and the sharing of information between local and international organizations. So the purpose of this paper is to examine early discussions over the provision of sex education to school-aged children in South Africa during the 20s and 30s. This is the first paper I've presented in this, this um, project, so I'd be very, very grateful for, any, uh, for all your comments and all of your ideas. My broader project traces the history of sex education for South African children and young people over the course of the 20th century, primarily in schools but also elsewhere. Um, oh, and in keeping with the scholarship on the subject, I define sex education quite broadly, including topics such as human reproduction, adolescence and puberty, relationships, contraception, and STDs. There's a rich, as Catherine has discussed, a rich scholarship on histories of sex education in the West um, and in Southern Africa. Um, but despite existence of a complex uh, body of work on histories of sexuality in Southern Africa, as I said, little scholarship, although some, has been devoted to sex education, and indeed, it seems to me, but I, I might be wrong on this, that little has been produced about the histories of sex education for children in the global south more broadly. Beginning with a discussion of the politics of negotiating sexual knowledge, the paper moves on to an analysis of sex education manuals written for black and white children, focusing particularly on the latter, just because there's very little scholarship on this. Um, and I argue that the raced nature of these pamphlets points to their function not only as providing very rudimentary information about human reproduction, but as texts functioning um, to channel um, adolescent sexual desire and curiosity into monogamous heterosexual marriage, as well as to police relationships and interactions between black and white South Africans. So as Roy Porter and indeed Leslie Hall um, have argued, sexuality is produced by the production of knowledge around it. In other words, sexuality could not exist in the culture without words, images, metaphors, and symbols to represent it. Sex education manuals for children are particularly useful for demonstrating how the creation of a body of knowledge about sex and sexual behavior is used to shape attitudes towards sex, sexuality, and relationships. Sex education manuals for children, which globally, as I said, originated after 1919, and which tended to be published at least initially by charities, public health departments, and churches, were intended to supersede the knowledge passed between children, between siblings and friends, and between children, parents, and guardians. Often written by medical professionals, they created an expert narrative about, of what should constitute appro appropriate sexual behavior. Put another way, the study of sex education, and manuals in particular, shows up how normal sexual behavior is constructed and inculcated. Above the fear that parents did not provide their children with adequate sex education, campaigners worried that children were at risk of receiving corrupt or, or immoral information from unofficial sources. The purpose of sex education manuals up until around the late 1930s was almost invariably to channel sexual curiosity and desire into marriage. But as Stoller has shown, in colonial settings in the 19th and early 20th centuries, education was also seen as a means of shoring up white power and, and of preventing contamination from colonized others, 
white children's sexuality, which was understood as developing earlier in warm climates and has been stimulated through contact with indigenous servants and peers, needed to be contained and controlled. So South Africa provides an interesting case for understanding how knowledge about sex meshed with efforts to establish and maintain racial boundaries. So sex education existed in a variety of forms in South Africa before the early 20th century. Advice and information about sex, sexuality, puberty, contraception and relationships were shared between adults and children long before these were subjects to be discussed in schools or areas of anxiety for philanthropists. Internationally, accompanying the development of sexology as a field of um, scholarly inquiry and a gradual shift in attitudes towards sex in marriage, a range of sex education manuals for married couples were produced in the late um, 19th and early 20th centuries. I've not found any evidence that local South African writers produce similar texts, and there's good reason to believe that they might have, because there was a, a kind of advice manual industry going um, in parts of the Cape Colony um, throughout the second half of the 19th century. Those manuals focused, though, largely on child-rearing. And as far as I can see, none of those authors, most of whom tended to be ministers, really focused on producing sort of similar kind of marriage guidance manuals. I must keep looking, though, but as far as I can see, they didn't produce any. But nonetheless, it is more than likely that the region's middle class, many of whom traveled abroad frequently and subscribed to international periodicals, read books and pamphlets published abroad. But there is a rich scholarship on sex education in pre-colonial and early colonial African societies. Um, a rich scholarship produced by social anthropologists during the first half of the 20th century demonstrates that adults in these communities tended to speak fairly openly about sex in front of children and young people. The onset of adolescence was frequently a cause for celebration and marked a moment in the lives of girls and boys when they were allowed entry into new age groups where information about relationships, sex, and contraception was circulated. While in some societies, adolescents were permitted to have some forms of sex before marriage, penetrative or otherwise, there were always strong sanctions against pregnancy out of wedlock. And Clive Glazer and, and Peter Delius have written, Communities attempted to negotiate the tricky terrain between acknowledged adolescent sexuality and the risk of premarital pregnancy through establishing limited forms of sexual release and effective forms of sexual monitoring and management. Adolescents received some guidance in the context of family, kin, group, and neighborhood, but probably the most striking aspect of these strategies was the central role played by peer group organizations and peer pressure. This was far from uniform, and there were considerable variations in, in the form that this took, and the role of peer groups was, almost, was most fully formalized and recognized in societies which practiced male and female initiation. The purpose of initiation was partly to impress upon young men and women the sexual behavior believed to be appropriate in adults. In this way, sex education broadly defined was woven into the process which facilitated a person's shift from childhood to youth to adulthood. But these customs began to change as missionaries established stations and schools near African communities. Missionaries frowned on premarital sex and the open discussion of sex and sexuality, particularly in front of children, and were also suspicious of initiation schools, and I'll return to this in a moment. Although converts shuttled between Christian teaching and African practices, Christianity had a profound influence, particularly over an emergent African middle class. The first efforts formally to teach sex education in South Africa emerged during this period of profound social change during the early 20th centuries. There'd been, there'd been panics over prostitution, so-called black peril, and homosexuality in mining compounds in the late um, 18th and early 19th centuries. But during the 20s and 30s, both the South African state and a range of philanthropic organizations became concerned about the implications of mass urbanization, particularly of women. The authorities were concerned about the presence of an increasingly large African population in the cities, about the interactions between blacks and whites, many of whom lived in the same slums, um, and the heightened possibility for resignation which occurred in large cities, and they were concerned about the spread of venereal disease. Um, as I said internationally, um, sex um, education programs for children developed out of social and moral, moral purity campaigns warning about the dangers of venereal disease post-1919. Uh, concerns ab about syphilis actually have a longer history in South Africa. Doctors identified an apparent syphilis epidemic in the 1880s, coinciding with the mineral revolution and mass um, em uh, an enormous influx of migrant labor from Southern Africa and beyond. But in 1919, the Public Health Act signaled a shift in the treatment of venereal disease, but mainly in whites. Whereas before this period, infection with syphilis was effectively criminalized, new research as well as eugenic concerns about the link between the health of whites and the health of the nation, um, 
meant that the Act founded municipal clinics where whites could receive free treatment as well as receive moral instruction to pre prevent the spread of disease. So the Act made the government responsible for the provision of VD treatment schemes as well as funding public health education. And this change in um, attitudes towards syphilis was also driven by a powerful philanthropic movement. The National Committee for Combating Venereal Disease uh, was founded in 1917 and allied with various other philanthropic organizations and led by a very powerful group of people. It provided propaganda in a variety of forms, um, both to blacks and to whites. And it, and it reported that its work met uh, with large, curious and enthusiastic um, audiences, distributing pamphlets and posters, providing lectures and screening films to trade unions, schools and societies, and organizing special health weeks in smaller towns and villages. The NCC VD propaganda was informed by the view that VD was primarily a social problem among whites. White audiences could be educated into moral sexual behavior. Um, and of course, it is a fairly conservative um, campaign. Its publication describes normal sex as occurring really only within marriage. Its propaganda for Africans was shaped by a different set of aims. Targeting mainly African men, its purpose was to ensure that African migrant workers remained healthy and efficient workers, particularly on the mines. They were urged to consult medical doctors, not healers, um, if they suspected that they were infected, and they were urged not to ha go anywhere near sex workers. Um, the Red Cross and the NCCVD also screened British VD films to the educated African middle class elite, but were very sure to excise those sections which portrayed whites living in ways described as immoral or impure. Um, and the reason why it's worth paying um, attention to these organizations is that these are these are the same organizations that begin to provide sex education to children so there's a you can there's a sort of line one can trace in their work from adults to children so to look more specifically at um, sex education uh, for African children during this period the combination of Christianity and urbanization brought about significant ways in which African children and young people learned about sex while it's important not to overstate the distinction between Christian Africans and those who continued to practice pre- and early colonial customs, it was certainly the case that Africans in urban areas didn't receive the same kind of detailed information about sex, sexuality, and contraception than did their rural peers, nor did they pass through the same processes of initiation or share the same um, attitudes towards sex before marriage. And these changes were accompanied by some anxiety from adults who worried about the morals and doings, particularly of young African women in cities, as, de as debates in the press, churches, and other forums available to Africans in the cities attested, African adults worried that young women, accused of engaging in sex work, of contracting VD, and, then, and of having children out of wedlock, were, un insuff were under insufficient parental control. Um, by the, during the same period, churches, missionaries, and many, many members of the African Christian elite were concerned about um, what was taught at circumcision schools believing that their purpose was really to inculcate immoral behavior in young people, particularly in young men. In 1938, the Anglican Church even appointed a committee of inquiry into how the church could replicate its own form of initiation schools to replace the circumcision schools. Now, it might seem contradictory for missionaries who had so long condemned sex education in African societies to suddenly become interested in providing sex education themselves. Um, and Clive Glazer describes, accounts for this very well. He writes, one of the great ironies of Christian conversion in South Africa is that the incidence of premarital pregnancy was substantially higher among Christian converts in the early 20th century than among so-called traditionalists. Christianity condemned and undermined a number of so-called barbarous African customs that had contained premarital pre pregnancy. By the 1920s, many more thoughtful missionaries began to realize that Christianity had stripped away important instruments of sexual socialization without offering meaningful replacements. Christianity needed to provide more systematic sexual and moral guidance to the youth. So this more systematic guidance um, appeared in a range of strategies. Um, Deborah Gateskill has written about the Mother's Prayer Unions, which were founded partly in response to concerns about young women's sexual misbehavior. These unions received talks on purity and how best to raise their daughters as moral adults. Mothers were encouraged to speak openly to their daughters about sex, a role which several African societies had never before bestowed on mothers. The Purity League, which was founded in 1919, the Pathfinders and the Wayfarers, which are sort of African adaptations of the Scouts and the Guides, were intended as organizations which socialized young Africans and where they would learn the value of sexual continence. Compounds for African young women in cities were also intended to protect them from premarital sex. They had mixed success. 
if these organisations were meant to replace the work of initiation schools, then they were not particularly successful. Their work was supplemented, though, by sex education manuals. Most of these were written by missionaries, ministers and nuns. An overwhelming majority were published by the missionary presses. So many of these manuals on social and physical hygiene, as they were called, were printed between the war, that wars that, as Natasha Erlang has remarked, the missionary presses considered that there were too many hygiene books published in Africa. As the title of one of the Church of England's most popular publications, God, Love and Marriage, which went through several editions, suggests the emphasis of these manuals was in persuading young readers that the only legitimate form of sexual release, particularly for women, was in marriage and for producing a family. Written by Sister Enid, an Anglican nun based in Bloemfontein, the text provided rudimentary information about uh, puberty and considerably more discussion of what constituted respectable sober adulthood. For all that these manuals and talks to youth organisations attempted to open up a discourse around young people's sexuality, the impulse behind this work was conservative and a response to young women's relative freedom from patriarchal authority in cities, or at least in part a response to this. They were directed, possibly, um, towards the creation of a respectable Christian urban African middle class. So now to turn to what was being written for white children. When J.A. Mitchell proposed in 1924 that sex education should be provided more widely for South African children, he was thinking about white children. His comments were echoed in 1937 when the South African National Child Welfare Society suggested that sex teaching needed to be provided in schools also for white children. It argued that whilst the duty of parents is to give sex teaching, the teacher and parent are often ignorant of the best method of approach. As a result of this, the council is of the opinion that to enable sex teaching to be given satisfactorily, physiology should be included in the school curriculum and te sex teaching given in the course of general lessons by experts who can advise parents desiring such advice. Um, this view that parents were not properly equipped to teach their children the correct form of sex education was one that was widely held. Yanni Malherba, a, a writer, teacher, and wife of the influential educationalist E.G. Malherba, was one of several white middle-class journalists who argued, for a argued in a range of popular publications in the 20s and 30s that white children needed intelligent, thorough sex education. And there was very little resistance to these arguments. Suzanne Clausen has demonstrated how eugenic discourses uh, or concerns about the degeneration of white South Africans, so to speak, crystallized around discussions of white motherhood. The urbanization of ever greater numbers of impoverished whites after 1910 gave rise to concerns that white control over the country's politics and economic resources was jeopardized by a large group of mainly Afrikaans-speaking poor whites. Survival of the white nation depended on its mothers and children. It was partly this belief that drove attempts to make contraception more widely available to poor white women to assist them in birth spacing and in reducing the size of their families. And it's worth noting that the influential synod of the Dutch Reformed Church decided not to condemn birth control at its meeting in 1932. And also the, that, um, it also drove... Um, there was also consensus that girls in particular needed to be educated about motherhood. There is evidence to suggest that mothercraft is taught in both English and Afrikaans medium schools, particularly those attracting middle-class pupils. The guides and other organizations and schools visited the mothercraft training center in Cape Town to receive instruction on the care of babies. This emphasis on providing young women with information and with training, and the observation that parents needed to have access to the correct forms of sex education compiled by experts, stem from the same belief that it was science, and particularly medical science, that would improve the quality of the white South African stock. As mothers needed to place themselves and their babies in the care of trained medical professionals, so parents and teachers needed to turn to experts for help with sex education for white children. Before 1939, when E.G. Malherber initiated the first discussions about the formal introduction of sex education in schools, this education was provided on a fairly ad hoc basis, depending on the interests of teachers and parents. Unlike sex education manuals for African children, though, those for whites um, emanated from child welfare, social and, and moral hygiene and public health organisations run by both English and Afrikaans speakers. In many instances, these organisations were the same or overlapped with those that produced sex education propaganda on venereal disease for adults. And it's important to note that the NCCVD become, is folded into the Red Cross in 1927. So there's this link between venereal providing propaganda from about venereal disease to adults to children through the Red Cross. 
The manual, Facts About Ourselves for Growing Boys and Girls, was published by the Red Cross in the Public Health Department of the City of Johannesburg in 1934. Written by RPH West, who I think was a teacher, in consultation with the leadership of the Red Cross, its foreword was provided by the city's medical officer for health, Dr. A.J. Milne, who noted that it had been published because of the natural reticence as well as the comparative ignorance of parents. Um, and, and this had resulted in widespread youthful unfamiliarity with the facts pertaining to human reproduction. This was a simple and, as he said, authoritative guide, which would, as the caption of the text's first illustration stated, lead readers to the light and clarity of knowledge. The, the, these readers were both children between the ages of around 10 and 12, as well as parents who could use it to instruct their children. It was also distributed among the members of the Transvaal Teachers Association and the province's public health authorities. To some extent, facts about ourselves are typical of the advice literature produced in other parts of the world during the 1930s. Writing about the United States, Julian Carter notes that the authors of these manuals were caught in a moral and epistemological bind. They desired to, to shape sexual activity at the same time as they feared stimulating it in their readers. Indeed, in his note to parents, West reassures his readers, his, um, reassures parents that facts about ourselves will not provide children with a thrill. Its purpose is to offer sober, serious information to the genuine seeker of truth. Um, how did they? So how did they encourage some forms of sexuality while actively discouraging others? In the first two or three decades of the 20th century, authors solved this conundrum by demonstrating to their readers the potentially appalling effects of sex outside marriage. It was not uncommon for these manuals to include photographs and detailed descriptions of the symptoms and physical manifestations of syphilis and gonorrhea, even for young children. This information was intended both to shock young readers out of having sex before marriage, as Carter notes, these manuals could best be described as facts about death rather than facts about life, um, as well as to call out and develop the, their nascent parental urges to cherish and care for children. However, from the mid-1920s around about, manuals change, and facts about ourselves re reflects this shift. This chief teaching was intended not only to impress upon children and young people the sanctity of marriage, but also to show them that sex and the production of healthy children were, were vital to the future prosperity of the nation. These manuals emphasize not contagion, but rather development, that sex was part of a God-given life force which animated life on Earth. This was a positive story about life and new beginnings. As Carter writes, this was a simultaneously evasive and expansive understanding of sex education. It drew on the language of evolutionary theory to explain that individual children recapitulated the, the development of the species. The stages through which children passed before they reached sexual adulthood reflected the sexual history of their ancestors. So these are the manuals that quite literally teach children about the birds and the bees. Facts about ourselves begins with a discussion of, of life as a great long ladder. At the top of the ladder is man, at the bottom, as he writes, at the bottom is a tiny atom or speck of life called an amoeba. Human beings are close to, closest of all to God at the top of the ladder because they are self-conscious and able to control their instincts. But these instincts are vital to the future of the humanity, as West Wright, uh, writes. He says, nature has put us into, into us this great desire to be the parents of children in order that the race to which we belong may continue in strength and in increasing numbers. To have children and to do well for them um, better the race to which you belong, and it is your duty to help your race to progress. As he notes earlier, progress should ever be our watchword. This passage establishes the dual focus of the pamphlet, the process by which babies are made, but also the importance of strengthening the race. As the reproduction of human beings demonstrates their superiority on the ladder of life, so there's also a kind of racial hierarchy which needs to be maintained. When West refers to race in this manual, he means white people. His discussion of human reproduction begins with a fairly detailed description of the, um, se the reproductive systems of chickens and plants, and then devotes one paragraph to what he calls the sex act. This is followed by a short <coughs> description of the development of the fetus and of pregnancy. In sum, West's writing on human reproduction takes up three pages of a 31-page pamphlet. And in an effort not to stimulate too much curiosity in his readers, he describes sexual intercourse in as brief and as clinical a way possible, and then moves on swiftly to describe to his readers why they should learn to control the sex instinct. Those who give in to lust are at risk of bringing shame to themselves, of producing illegitimate children, and of contracting what he calls the most terrible diseases from which man has suffered. In addition to this, he advises his readers against thinking or talking about sex. He says, it's wise to avoid undue interest in the sex organs, and a good way to do that is by turning your thoughts elsewhere to healthy occupations and interests, particularly sport. Um, 
And he writes, at all times, avoid silly or unnecessary talk about so big and so sacred a subject. For all his purported desire to make clear knowledge about sexual reproduction, West shrouds it in religious mystery, referring frequently to God and the Bible. His discussion about the uterus, for instance, begins with an analysis of hymns. Sex, in other words, is too complex a, complex a subject fully to be communicated to young people, who should in any case display as little interest in the subject as possible. However, he does encourage his readers to understand the significance of furthering the health of the race, as they should take care to keep their bodies clean and healthy as adolescents, and he refers fleetingly to puberty, so they should think about the health of their race more broadly. West, like other eugenicists of the period, argues that the white race, race exists above natives, his language, on the ladder of life. And he writes, in South Africa, we have a huge population of natives. They outnumber the Europeans by roughly four to one. Many great thinkers tell us that we are 2,000 years older than our natives. In other words, we as Europeans have the great advantage of 2,000 years of civilization behind us, with all that it means in knowledge, self-control, and care for others. Their instincts are exactly the same as ours, but it is not reasonable or just to expect that they will have the same control or work, um, over the working of them. And he pays particular attention to how girls should behave in the African men, and I think it's worth quoting this in full. He writes, the girls are perhaps asleep, or else only partly awake, and their bodies carelessly covered by the bedclothes. The temptation to the native may be far more severe than is ever realised, and any wrongdoing on his part would be very terrible to a girl, while the law visits upon him a very dreadful punishment. Cases of assault have occurred on many occasions, and it is our bounden duty to avoid even the possibility of such a thing. No native should be allowed in a bedroom whilst a girl is in it, whether she is in bed or not. He goes on to advise girls to dress sensibly and nicely when near African men, to avoid drawing attention to their bodies. Boys should just remember that they have a higher standard of civilization when speaking to Africans. West's implication that Africans had little or no control over their sexual urges was by no means unique to him, but his inclusion of a discussion informed by anxieties around black peril and resignation of how white children should interact with African adults, particularly men, is, as far as I can tell, unique among sex education manuals. But this section is a logical um, extension of his, point that sec of his point that sex education is vital to furthering the health and power of the white race. Indeed, Mitchell's forward to the manual concludes with the point that the subject is not only of considerable importance to the future welfare of the country, but it is one which has a very direct bearing on the solution of our poor white problem. With its references to servants, to separate bedrooms for siblings, to school and to outings to the bioscope, the South African slang for the cinema, Facts About Ourselves is very obviously written for white middle-class children, and its purpose is to encourage this group of children to grow up to become adults who marry and who produce children within the bounds of monogamous heterosexual marriage. This is not so much a manual on human reproduction, but rather on how to maintain a segregationist state. So to conclude, despite its insistence that it purveys only authoritative facts, West's Facts About Ourselves demonstrates how sex education was mobilized to construct and maintain racial boundaries in 1930 South Africa. In a similar way, God, Love and Marriage instructed African children in the norms of respectable middle-class living. It was a manual for learning how to occupy a subordinate position within South African society, ensuring that ungovernable African sexuality was kept in check. In this way, although the introduction of formal sex education and the production of sex education manuals for adults and children in South Africa mirrored similar processes abroad, they were inflected by local anxieties about race and to a lesser extent gender. Sex education became a means of engineering a segregated South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Really, really interesting. Good. It was such a pleasure to hear the papers together as well. Um, we have plenty of time for questions and discussion, feedback, comments. <laughs> yeah. I have a question from you. About, um, I don't think you mentioned masturbation. Yes. which I regard as the critical defense point in the war against sexual intelligence mm. that comes from, think of Baden Powell, mm. who must have been very wide viewing mm. in South Africa, um, mm. rovering to success, which I misread versus Roger to success. <laughs> <laughs> as it should, it, it should be. It's, it, absolutely, and it's, you know, it's very heavily pointing out the dangers of abusing your racial organ yeah. in this way. Mm. Um, so I just wonder if that's, if, if that's something which recedes as a, as a preoccupation of your mm. advice book writers, or whether it's there, mm. rather than right through. Mm. Are we taking one, one at a time? <laughs> 
Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you. I had, I, I had not included Baden Powell. Um, and he, and to some extent, will then precede these manuals as well. Um, as far as I can see, um, there is this anxiety around masturbation in these, in these manuals, but it's not the preeminent anxiety. Um, it, it's certainly present. The main anxiety, really, is around sex before marriage, less so around masturbation. You could include masturbation under that heading if you want to be particularly... That's a good point. Not as far as I can tell. Yeah. But I mean, it's quite interesting, though, that masturbation is never named in these manuals, that they might, there might be um, references to um, you know, not paying too, atten too much attention to your genitals, but there's not, uh, you know, rather going and playing sport. But there's none, there's none of this sort of specific uh, warning against masturbation. I wonder, though, whether those warnings would have perhaps been aimed at slightly older children and boys, and possibly to adult men. Um, I, I wonder possibly if that advice was being given, yes, to adults. I'm sorry, this isn't a very good answer, but the answer is, as far as I can tell, that it's there, but it's not the, the key anxiety, that other anxieties seem to have yeah. superseded it. Yes. I mean, certainly in the British case, there's lots of examples of children being warned against masturbation at a, quite an early age, age and, yes. and then it's expected to carry them through, mm -hmm. through. a kind of purity yeah. all the way through. I haven't minutes. picked this up, but I think that's possible because the first sex education manuals are only being written and produced in South Africa during the 20s and 30s, so there's nothing really been written before then, at least as far as I found. Thank you. Leslie and Sean, Leslie first. Um, I, I have questions for both speakers. It's very wondering, in terms of Catherine's paper, when you were talking about the role of Christianity in religion, whether there's any kind of counter-Christian, sort of reformed, um, enlightened, liberal Christian agenda going on. Because I mean, this is, I mean, there's certainly been a lot, lot of work going on at the moment within the UK about the role of Christianity in making new forms of sexual knowledge through the late 19th, early 20th century. I mean, particularly, I think, in the 1920s with these people who are being influenced by sexology, by feminism, by psychoanalysis, and they are trying to produce a new, and actually very positive discourse around sex as, as God-given, although it can obviously be abused. And I'm just wondering if that's there at all, or whether it's all very kind of puritanical down on. And then for, for Sarah, I, I was wondering, um, you say there, there's a lot being talked about about sex education. Is it actually happening? Because this is what I find in the UK, is that there is a lot of, of anxiety about you know people writing and talking about enlightening the young and teaching them there's the production of manuals and books about it, but um, certainly within the educational system, and I think one might find a different picture or possibly not if I started looking at youth organisations, mm -hmm. but in the educational system, it's, it's extremely sporadic and it goes on being extremely sporadic well into the late 20th century, and um, it's still a bit of a postcode lottery to this mm -hmm. day. Hmm, very interesting question, and in fact, some of my answer leaks into your terrain. Yes, I have come across um, some very important counter-tendencies. Let me start with the most interesting of all, Charlotte Matreke, the first woman of African descent to take a, a degree in science from South Africa. She traveled to Colombia University to the Institute of Education, the Teachers Institute. And while there, obviously is influenced by the progressive era um, literature, which is strongly inflected with that kind of feminism of Florence Kelly and others, uh, around social improvement, but also around empathy and around science as a liberator. And she is I think pretty much blown away by some of the things that she encounters and learns, does a BSc, 
and then does a teacher's diploma and travels around the US working in non-conformist Christian communities, very different from the um, American Board Mission form that had developed in this colonial setting that she grew up in, or this uh, white settler setting. So although these are the parent bodies of the schools and churches she grew up in in South Africa, they, they are dominated by Unitarian and congregational uh, interpretations of Christianity, where there is a strong presence of anti-slavery sort of legacy. Um, she, for example, preaches at a church called Sojourner, Sojourner Truth Baptismal Center, which is in Oberlin, Ohio, where the Seneca Falls Convention um, met and where Sojourner Truth gave her famous speech. And so she comes back to Durban um, and travels back to her home area of Umbumbulu. Um, and in some ways, who continues to be empowered by this experience and has some impact, finds some like-minded souls. And even into the 1950s and 60s, when she was a very much older woman, her slightly different take. For example, let me just give you one example. She really think, thought that there needed to be a lot of focus on love and courtship. The art of kissing, for example, something she writes about. I mean, is kissing flippin' well mentioned? So <laughs> the idea of um, pleasurable sexual activity. It, it always interested me that um, in her purity manual, so she did use the discourses of the day of sexual purity, she spoke about how kissing is widely accepted in the continental United States as a form of courtship because it allows people to get close and have contact that won't be dangerous and produce fertility. And in a way, she's, she may be mirroring some of the literature that was that many anthropologists, like the brilliant Monica Hunter-Wilson, had written about the intelligence mm -hmm. and empathy with which Kosa and particularly Mpondo people approached sexual awakening. So this extraordinary Christian woman, whose father was a, a very important um, man of the cloth, who comes to Cambridge to do her PhD, and whose book, published when she's 25, Reaction to Conquest, uh, The Life and Stories of People of Pondo Descent. The foreword is actually written by Smuts, and it's published by Cambridge University Press in 1927. It's extraordinary. A new edition comes out in 1932. This young and very interesting woman talks a lot in her work about love and courtship and kissing and sex between the thighs and young girls' sexual debut with each other and with boys having sexual debut with themselves and with others and uh, talks about um, sexual stimulation of the sexual organs and the way that people incorporate this into a moral life in a pre-colonial uh, history that she traces which still has vestiges in the world that she's brought up in. And then Charlotte McClake, who never uses words like okumecho or kusum or talks about intercorial sex or masturbation or sex between the thighs or sucking or licking, but she does talk about kissing. And she does talk about an, an anatomy. There's a very interesting um, st phrase that the historian Jim Campbell has picked up on in his book in which Charlotte McClake figures. She talks about the people must be careful to think that scientific analysis and anatomical analysis will necessarily lead to repression because the more we know about the science of the body, the more we may see desire and its expressions as natural. Mm -hmm. So that route is quite unusual, and I would not say it's in any way, it's not even counter-hegemonic enough to mm -hmm. be very visible. Um, and I think that that tendency may have been developing. Sarah can say more about that in sex ed manuals. But you can see, for example, in some of the doctor's training manuals, in some of the school programs, in some of the theater pieces, which also come into their own um, as drum magazine explodes in the 1950s, and as new forms of traveling theater appear with sort of risque cabaret acts and the introduction of sort of Freudian pop language a little bit more into South African public life, particularly in the cities, you do see um, that approach to um, 
to sexual life by professed Christians. But I would say that by the time they, that these people then begin to confront this reinventing itself as ultra-Calvinistic uh, Afrikaner national state religion bulwark, that, I mean, which enemy do you face first? There isn't, I mean, I didn't develop that part of the paper here, but I definitely see that the, the energies of those kinds of people go into, for example, Charlotte McClake has spent the last 20 years of her life trying to get people of Indian and African descent in her area to cooperate as a unified bloc against white hegemony. So she gets seen as a figure of racial peace and harmony and of struggling to develop um, autonomy and self-worth. And the themes around sexual freedom and the focus on young boys. Oh, that's the bit I left out. I'll end on this. So she does something really unusual. She starts a school for shepherd boys. She's the biggest problem is that girls are always being targeted for being made into like modern citizens. And what we really need is companionship where, where boys and girls can be more equal to each other. You won't have egalitarianism. She doesn't use words like feminism, but you won't have equality unless boys and girls are being opened up to a worldview in the same time. And what's happening is that boys are going into industrial work very early and girls are going into domestic labor, nursing or something. And there's this, this deep divide opening up. And maybe she was also giving a lot of voice to her own biography. She turned down many marriage proposals at this time. She never married and she found no partner that she connected with. And so she started a school for boys where they would be able to come in the evenings to study after they'd done their shepherding work. Uh, and so there's that sense, I suppose, of um, gender equality in her whilst being a Christian. But I must end by saying that she later on leaves Christianity, gets extremely upset with the reticence of the Church of England and the withdrawal of what she considers the progressives in American congregational settings. And she becomes a member of the Baha'i faith, the first person in Africa, to my knowledge, who does. And she actually translates their books into Isizulu. So she, that's an icon iconoclastic answer about a rare individual. But it's... I'm just sort of thinking as I'm talking, I think it's it's not a very powerful counter movement in Afrique du Sud. So I don't think so. Sarah, do you um, agree with me? I um, oh, well, and, um, um, well certainly in the sex education manuals um, produced during the thirties, you can see the sort of strand of thinking that believes that sex in marriage is certainly a very good thing and that it should be a pleasurable experience for both men and women. I mean, that, that is certainly present. There's very little advice as to how to achieve this. <laughs> but that, that, so you can see that those kind of strands of thinking, and I mean, and it makes complete sense in a sort of eugenicist discourse around encouraging people to have lots of children. So it's, it's certainly present in these manuals, this belief, but, but there's very little information about how to get there, as I said. But to, to answer your question, um, uh, does does talk actually translate into sex education? Of course not, <laughs> unfortunately, particularly until 1939, because um, as far as I can see, it's, um, sex education only really begins to be introduced formally in schools post-1939. Um, however, it does begin to enter into children's consciousness in, in various ways through your youth organisations. This, I must admit, I must still... Um, Investigate, which is why I think I've probably missed out entirely on masturbation. Um, but middle class children, white middle class children, certainly received more sex education than did other children. Um, and I think this is largely because there are certain white middle class schools, particularly, particularly those that are Afrikaans median, that wholeheartedly buy into this idea of saving the white race. So sex education is introduced under different guises, under mothercraft, for instance. Um, it's taught in biology or in physiology. So it is provided, but it's given a different name. It's not in the kind of detail that one would expect, but, but it's certainly present in some of those curricula. So it's introduced, as I say, in these periods, for particular children in particular schools for very particular reasons. It's not widespread. Charlotte? 
regret I can only give you a partial answer. Um, I don't know yet. Um, as to the, the missionaries themselves, yes, they are. You're exactly right. Second or third generation missionaries have been working there for a long time, have had long sort of contact with uh, the communities that they've been working with. And I think this is partly behind these kind of evolving ideas around how sex education should be provided. Sister Enid, who writes um, God, Love and Marriage, seems to be a really special case all on her own. Um, she, she, she seems to have been a fairly eccentric figure who develops this interest in sex education more or less in, on her own and then manages to persuade an Anglican church, which is really very willing to listen, to, to publish her manual. Um, so she, she, is really, uh, she really seems to stand out among, among them. Um, but, I mean, as I said, this, this, the, the idea of women religious producing these manuals is not really all that far-fetched, considering that they have, there's very little sex in them. I mean, they're about, I mean, they're about becoming a married person, about what kind of, a per, what kind of an adult the, um, the society around you wanted you to become. And in many ways, these women's long contact with children felt that they were in, in exactly the position to write these kind of manuals. As I say, as, I know, as far as them being exported internationally, I don't know. It's an incredibly important question. Also, I don't know how unique they are. To the best of my knowledge, um, they, there's, there are other attempts at sex education going on in the continent. I know that, for instance, among girls in Zanzibar, that there's a certain amount of effort that's going on in the early 20th century. But these are all, they're, they're very, as far as I can tell, there are fairly few links between these groups. There, were, there was some contact between um, what was then Southern Rhodesia and South Africa around sex education manuals, those kind of conversations. But as far as I can tell, there's no kind of continent-wide concerted attempt. It was ad hoc, it was sporadic. But as my research progresses, I might come back and completely contradict myself. But that is specific, yeah. So it, is, seems, it seems to me at this moment. Significant difference, um, or can you, you know, can you pick any out between the Afrikaans manuals and the English-speaking manuals mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, so conservatism in the sense of duty and and just the language used? Because mm -hmm. that would be interesting to know. Um, from what I can see so far, um, the first uh, manuals produced for white children. Um, uh, in, the, in the 1930s were written in English and then translated into Afrikaans. So they would be receiving the same kind of education. Um, so at least initially during this period, there is no difference. Um, and it's um, partly because, I mean, that the, there's the same impulse behind wanting to get sort of both white and Afrikaans children to become... Uh, the kind of adults who would be useful to um, to South Africa. Mm. I would suspect, though, and this I must still see, that as African nationalist organisations become more interested in this subject um, after the Second World War, then I would expect to begin to see a difference. Um, and as, I mean, yes, that that is what I would suspect at the moment. Um, I was going to say something in a moment. Um, yes, that I sometimes wonder um, when we talk about this period in the early 20th century in South Africa, if we possibly overstate the distinctions between Afrikaans speakers and English speakers. There's a huge amount of overlap in the membership of the organizations that provide these manuals. Um, there are some Afrikaner nationalist organizations, I think particularly of the um, RCF Yofia, which is the yeah. Afrikaans Chris yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, There's a huge amount, so I mean the RCF Yofia, which is an Afrikaans Christian organization, I mean, as Mareka de Toy has written, I mean, <laughs> you know, all the scholarship, um, they, that they are producing um, pro-contraceptive, pro-literature. Um, uh, but then, and they, they, they work is specifically among Afrikaans women, but there's no sense of, sort of spe that they, they work specifically for Afrikaans women, but there's no sense that they would want to exclude English speakers. Really? They just, they tell so, so, so soon after... Yes. The, the, the OB, yeah. OB. I mean, I'm thinking that. I mean, I think that the reason. I mean, their interest is directed against Africans uh, towards Africans people because they are poor. They are, you know, relatively speaking, far fewer poor English speaking people. So they see themselves as targeting poor whites who happen to be sp mainly Afrikaans speakers. So, I mean, there's a, there's an overlap in these organisations. Um, there is yes, of course, a nationalist imperative in groups such as the RCP fear, but 
There's no sense yet that we as Afrikaners need a different kind of sex education. That comes later. That comes later, as far as I can tell. Thanks very much for two incredibly enriching and absorbing presentations. It's just a thrill to be in the audience. Thank you. Um, I suppose I've, I've got questions to both Catherine and Sarah, and they they um, hang around the issue of science. And Catherine gave us a very nuanced history on the different uses of science and how they've been politicized, particularly in the Mbeki era. Um, it led me to wonder about how particularly in the aftermath of the Second World War and the Nazi Holocaust and you know, this kind of desire for scientists to eschew a eugenics racial ordering of society, how that led to apartheid's creation of folk kinder and an emphasis on cultural markers of difference rather than on, um, on scientific markers of, of racial difference. And so I just wanted to invite Catherine to reflect a little bit more on the kind of cultural making of, of sexual deviance in South Africa. Um, and to, to Sarah, you know, you've given us such a, a, an innovative and exciting overview um, of this important field. Um, I just I wanted to hear more perhaps about um, you know, your position science and um, Christianity is quite oppressive in some ways. Mm. And I wanted to hear more about um, potentially emancipatory or progressive mm. approaches. And I'm thinking here about people like Havelock Ellis or mm. Ewan Bloch. You, know, you, you speak about how sex wasn't actually, you know, it was maligned and, mm. and, um, and it was really seething below the surface of a lot of these manuals. But is there mm. a way in which you can discern more progressive approaches mm. um, from, you know, kind of key thinkers in sexual science or key psychiatrists with the advancement of mm. endocrinology mm. Or, or psychiatry? Are, are there any progressive influences that you've mm. picked up on in your work? Mm. Interesting question. Mm. I was thinking about Olive Schreiner even before you said Havelock Ellis, and that goes back also to the, um, yeah, and it's interesting that Schreiner was also very good friends with Smuts, but that's another kettle of fish. But maybe there are, yeah, I, we these are very provoking questions. We need to spend more time on them. But to try and directly answer what you're saying, um, I do, and this goes back partly to the question about Afrikaans English distinctions in whiteness. Um, I don't know if any of you know of the very, very important in a way, inventor of Afrikaans. I mean, Isabel Hoffmeyer's amazing work brings us to light. And that is this guy called Etienne uh, Leroux. Mm -hmm. And he really, in a way, I don't know if you've read the biography of him. I've only read the English biography called The Darkening Stream. And in many ways, it's the late 19th and early 20th century effort to populate that as an anti-colonial language with um, drawing Yes, some boundaries against uh, Malaysian and other Creoles in the language, but asserting a much more fragile connection to Europe than later. So a sense that this is an, I mean, after all, they choose the name African for their language. So this is going to be a language of civilized people of Africa who have a poetic impulse and are not like the British and are anti-imperial and republican people. And that moment of the birth of Afrikaans as a language is given such sexual and erotic expression in the poetry of 1880 to 1910. It's visceral. And so to then encounter in the 1950s or 60s, um, or even when I was at school in the late 60s and 70s, of course, we were forced to learn a canon of Afrikaans poetry by then as if it existed for years. I was totally shocked at the age of 17 to learn how recent Afrikaans was as a written language because I imagined it was centuries old because I was presented with an oeuvre which said, this is who we are and we've always been this way. And I was like, maybe that's why I became a historian. I was like, oh my God, things can be invented. So when, you know, when finally read Benedict Anderson at university, it was but passé. So here these people invented their nation from words. And in that reckoning, this is a soft, sensual, sexual, erotic people of the land. Yes, people of the book and people of the gun and people of the cook sister, but anti, anti a kind of interpretation of science that, that is not um, what it's Smuts call his form of science, holistic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that is very influenced by Gandhiism ideas, by Britain in the 1880s to 1920s debates. Um, he spends time in Bohemia, you know, he's an opium addict and so on and so forth. And he has relationships with young girls, with uh, a Gujarati shop owner's daughter. He has an erotic relationship with a man. All of this is in his poetry. 
but it's completely censored out by the 1950s when he's become the national poet and you're forced to read him for your matriculation exams and he's cited by uh, Favut's, uh, uh, I can't remember who the Minister of Education was when Favut becomes, mm -hmm. do you remember who was? Anyway, he gets cited in speeches. It's the Etienne of, you know, the springbok leaping and the blue sky, it sounds like the <laughs> national anthem. But, um, you know, he, so that, that is a creation and an invention that is then post facto. And the, that speaks to all this anxiety that's coming out in Sarah's writing. So I think people like Maria Rothman and others would be part of some of that. But uh, the anxiety about how Afrikaners are disappearing into Afrikaans speaking colors is so powerful. And the place that that plays out on is around controlling sex. So I think masturbation might even have been preferred. I mean, I don't know. You spill your seed, but not into the orifices of people with a different color skin. And mm. you know, if I can just bring some biography in, um, I've got much more knowledge about Catholic um, impact than Protestant. Um, and the, the Catholics are, you know, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, that's their name, the Irish order that takes over Joburg for about um, eight years. The, the struggle that those men and women were obviously going through in their own sexual journey, um, you know, I still felt that impact. When I got my first watch when I was six in order to go to the convent, and Sister Bernadette told us that you will pray on the hour every hour for the sexual sins. I mean, we understood it as sexual sins later, but she had the sins of the past hour and the sins ye are yet to commit and so we did our first holy confessions with quite a hectic sexual agenda um, when we were seven and we did them every Wednesday and this might seem like you know Ireland in 19 you know Joyce's time this is like Joburg in the middle of mining booms when people are whizzing around with Mercedes Benzes and the government is trying to stop TV so it's 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 kind of what do you call something out of time and place? Anachronism. It's an anachronism. That's what it is, and that's going on whilst people are sort of hysterical about Drum magazine showing photographs of beautiful women in bikinis on the front page, and all this madness is happening at the same time as body heat is banned. You know, and I don't know what other would be common. You know rave on Calcutta, whatever these things were, or, or um, Peter Sellers movies. There was a Peter Seller movie called, um, i trying to remember, where people jump in and out of a swimming party. pool with bubbles. Party. party. When people showed that, they were arrested and sent to prison. You know, this is all happening at the same time. So I suppose that's a long way around trying to answer the question about um, that, double, that double vision. And science is is breaking up into its different parts. In the 1970s and 80s, I think you can see this, especially, say, in Johannesburg, and a figure like Philip Tobias is so interesting there. He's a secular Jew. He's a socialist-leaning member of, yes, the establishment. He's probably gay. He's completely anti-apartheid. He's ready to face prison. He you know, does the anatomical work on Steve Bantubiko's corpse. He is the most important, almost like, um, what's the guy, Kinsey? He's the, he discusses sex in all its polymorphous forms in his anatomy classes so that hundreds of students come to listen to him. He's a PhD in genetics from the University of Chicago. He's a PhD in, a, in anatomy from the University of London. He has um, a PhD in medicine, internal medicine, and he's making a huge argument about the cradle of humankind being in South Africa being that all human, the genetic human code, the mitochondrial Eve, begins in Southern Africa. And he's producing that argument in the face of the argument that people of African descent only cross over the Zambezi long after whites had established. And he makes the argument that every South African child should learn um, about paleoanthropology and about fossil remains and human evolution when it's banned from South African schools. And he is the foremost scientist in Johannesburg. And he has a huge impact, he educated more than 20,000 doctors. So there's definitely a strong counter tendency. But you know, he's very much within a space. You know, South Africans live in bubbles. And does he get on national TV? Is he in the newspapers every day? Is he more widely known? He's very widely known in the West until the 1980s. He's not known outside of the sort of medical fraternity in Joburg. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. Um, the way I think about answering 
about science as a progressive force at the moment, and the thing that springs immediately to mind is feminism. Um, and I mean, and then this, of course, South Africa is no different from the rest of the world. But early feminists are behind the VD movement. Um, we got a huge number of those early feminists working in the Red Cross and have an influence of the right of these sex ed manuals. And they can mobilize science to argue for quite a radical idea, which is um, chastity for men. Um, and, and that's effectively what these manuals are arguing, is that uh, as women need to be pure, so, so should men. That they, they too need to play sport until they get married. Um, so in that sense, there is this kind of radical idea that marriage needs to be equal in the sense that the same form of sexual consonance is required of both men and women. So I, I, can, I can see it there. I'm, I must give some more thought to see it, finding it elsewhere. But thank you very much. It's very useful. We have time for two more questions or so, if there are any. Yeah. Well, I've got a question for Catherine, okay. which is about the, the initial point you made about the clampdown on various forms of sexual expression and sexual rep uh, representation uh, done by the nationalists in the, in the 50s. Yeah, it starts in the 50s. 74 is sort of the high point, yeah. And what I was wondering was about the, the response of the leadership of the ANC mm. of men who have been educated by the missionaries. I mean, I have this sort of image of Oliver Tambo as being a puritanical person. I don't know whether he was, but that's, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this leadership, was it in fact, in a way, half inclined to not collude in the legislation, but to see that there was a certain point to some of it, at any rate, and therefore to modify their potential opposition? Yeah, there's a section of the paper where I go quite wild by, I found, I went into Bantustan Archive. Let me answer the question through the back door. I'll get back to Oliver Tambo. So as you well know, South Africa gets carved up into these pretend states that are puppets of Pretoria, known as the Bantustans. And there are 15, and some of them are given full autonomy, only recognized by Taiwan and uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and that's it. And those Bantustans um, are headed and run by people handpicked by Pretoria, but that nominally are, are declared traditional chiefs. And so people's um, ethnic, and this comes back to the question of, of culture that Rebecca asked me, which I didn't get to answer, the idea in which um, sexuality, intimacy, citizenship um, is all bound up with cultural expression, and you will have your own culture and be in your own place, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, Matanzima, let's just take the Mandela, the, the Transkei Bantustan. Matanzima is Mandela's cousin. They grew, grew up in a similar way, go to similar schools, are confirmed in the same church, um, you know, practice Methodism and so on and so forth. And Matanzima, as head of the Transkei, like his counterparts in the other more resourced Bantustans, spends a lot of time <coughs> talking about morality in the Transkei Bunga. The Umtata records are filled with this completely <coughs> supports the 1974 Act. Mm -hmm. And what the, the contradiction that emerges there is that Mangope, who heads up a put at Swana, um, gets, like in the American uh, Native Reserves, gets um, ec very excited about opening a casino, which is not allowed under South African law in the territory of the Republic. So he accepts a, the brand new first casino license, Evan, so Sun City is born. And then Matanzima really wrestles with whether the Wild Coast Sun, as it's called, the grotesque creation of Sol Kersner, who now opens up like a hotel in Dubai a week, that opens up then on the Transkei Coast. Both places offer triple X adult entertainment, nude flesh, and cross-racial sex. Uh, Swaziland slightly preceded this. The country of the kingdom of Swaziland had the first casino in southern Africa. And the delight of the casino is not so much the roulette table or the gambling at the card table. It's in fact the, 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 the movies and the shows and the live adult sex acts that are allowed to be performed. Long way around of saying that in the whole set of agendas that the ANC in exile have around what they're going to uh, prioritize in attacking. I can find no evidence, and I've been talking to people who actually worked at Radio Freedom and who were deeply involved 
with this and I've read a thesis that most of us have finished reading by Carla Samparis, a PhD she completed about 18 months ago at uh, Rhodes and she has gone and spent a lot of time in the ANC archives in their public broadcasting section. So where they were consolidating the ideas for broadcast into the exile community and that very strongly linked to London and, and to the, the, the agencies here. And where they got flack was actually from the Scandinavian supporters. And Hugh Macmillan's new book makes us clear about the ANC in <coughs> Osaka, because the Scandinavian cohort of the anti-apartheid movement were saying a number of things, including get with feminism, and what about this idea? Lindsay Manicom's written on this in Toronto. And the ANC patriarchs were fighting back. Mm -hmm. And your hunches are, I believe, correct. I'll have to do more of my own research to give empirical evidence, but based on other people's published work, including the ANC's approach to the early uh, evidence of the epidemic, it's clear that although there are counter tendencies, people like Corsi Kaba and others who were important nurses in the ANC were off on a very different wicket right from the beginning. She spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union in Moscow and in Uppsala. She had a very different agenda and she was coming up against uh, enormous thwarting of her ideas. But I think there was uh, quite a strong sense of um, that's not part of our struggle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the sexualization of South Africa is a Western phenomenon that needs to be thwarted. And we will, if not uh, give voice support, give tacit support to such things as the, uh, even the prohibition of mixed marriages act is not high on the agenda of the ANC. Sorry, I know that's a gloomy thing to say. But <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I'd just like to thank um, both speakers for wonderful papers and a great discussion. Thank you for your good questions. <laughs>